Hello everyone, welcome to session 5 of LTech 782 Design-Based Research in Education. Believe it or not, we're into the second to last week of the summer session. And as shown here, this week we'll hold our second Critical Friends meeting and submit a final video reflection. Next week, we'll focus on the third phase, evaluation and reflection. And I wanted to let you know that there won't be a video reflection that week so that you can focus on completing your proposal, which is due Monday, August 17th. So let's get into it. As I mentioned to many of you in office hours, this week we're focusing on the second phase of McKenney and Reeves generic model. And of course, that phase has to do with design and construction. We'll be concentrating on the design portion of this phase as we don't have time to actually construct or develop our solutions. That's okay. And my guess is you're going to like focusing on the design phase more than analysis and exploration because it is going to feel more concrete. Ideally, it's going to help us figure out what the heck our investigations or solutions are actually going to be. And this phase is going to help us start thinking about how to research our proposed solutions. So before we get into all of that, let's recap what we've done so far. Well, for the past two weeks, we've been engaged in analysis and exploration. We focused on the inputs of that phase, including an initial orientation, a literature review, and some form of exploration. On top of that, we focused on outputs. And hopefully at this point, we each have some form of a problem statement, a long range goal, partial design requirements, and some initial design guidelines or propositions. So now that we've done all of this, where do we go from here? How do we take these outputs and begin to design a solution, an intervention that is likely to address the discrepancy specified in our problem statements? Well, according to McKenney and Reeves, the answer to that comes in the form of design and construction, which is outlined here in this graph. The goal of this phase is to design a well-considered intervention, which is grounded in both theory and reality. Now, in terms of process, McKenney and Reeves label the first part of the design phase as exploring solutions. This has to do with figuring out what might be designed. Remember, that what you might design might be a product, a policy, a process, or a program. In the exploring solution stage, we want to cast a wide net, switching back and forth between creative thinking and analytical thinking. Some of the activities include idea generation, idea consideration, which involves sifting through ideas and judging them to find the ones that have the power to live on, and idea checking, which means checking the inner logic and potential viability of certain ideas. From there, the next part of the design phase involves mapping solutions. At this point, the purpose is really to understand the potential of one or two possible solutions. To do that, some of the key activities include refining design requirements and propositions, identifying what McKenney and Reeves call a skeleton of a solution, and that means thinking about materials and resources, activities and processes, and participants and implementation. And then finally, we will begin to detail the specifications of our chosen design. And this is what I want to focus on in the rest of this video. This brings us to the idea of conjecture mapping, which is based on a 2014 article by William Sandoval, a professor of education at UCLA. Now, I want to introduce you to conjecture mapping because I think the ideas in the McKenney and Reeves chapter are a bit too vague to be useful. So to help all of you think through the details of your solutions, I want to walk you through the process of conjecture mapping. So what is it? Well, according to Sandoval, conjecture mapping is a means of specifying theoretically salient features of a learning environment design and mapping out how they are predicted to work together to produce desired outcomes. Put more simply, conjecture mapping is a way to concretize the what of your design idea and the why of your design idea. And of course, it does this in a systematic and easy to understand way. It is a way of conceptualizing design research. 
Now, as you can see here, there are four main parts of conjecture mapping, and the way you read a conjecture map is from left to right. So let's walk through these four main parts. The first part of a conjecture map is a high-level conjecture, a supposition or a hypothesis. Sandoval defines a high-level conjecture as a theoretically principled idea of how to support some desired form of learning. In other words, it is a general idea about how to foster some educational goal. Here's an example. Scientific argumentation requires appropriation of discursive practices of making, justifying, and evaluating claims. Now, that's an example of a high-level conjecture, meaning if you want students to learn how to argue scientifically, then they have to appropriate discursive practices around making claims, justifying them, and ultimately evaluating. So that's the high-level conjecture. A critical responsibility of the design researcher is to take that high-level conjecture and figure out how it can be embodied in a specific design solution. The embodiment of the conjecture articulates the features of that design, and this usually involves specifying four kinds of elements. The first element has to do with the tools and materials of the solution. This might include software programs, instruments, manipulatables, media, or other resources. These are the things we usually have in mind when we're thinking about designing an intervention or a solution. The second element, task structures, describes the tasks learners are expected to do in your solution. What are the goals of the tasks? What are the criteria, the standards, and so on? The third element explains how participants, for example, students and teachers, are expected to participate in those tasks. In other words, what are they going to do? What are the roles and responsibilities that they will be asked to take on via your solution? The fourth element of embodiment is discursive practices. In other words, ways of talking. How are the participants going to discuss and reflect and interact about the tasks and the materials you're asking them to work with? Now, stepping back, these four elements all interact with each other. And ideally, they're designed deliberately to work together to achieve your envisioned design. Now, a critical concept in conjecture mapping is that embodied designs do not lead directly to outcomes. Instead, they lead to mediating processes. Sandoval gives us a useful analogy here. He writes, an airplane produces flight as an outcome to the extent that it generates sufficient lift. In this example, lift is the mediating process required to produce the outcome flight. In theory, these mediating processes will lead to desired outcomes, which is the next part of the conjecture mapping. One way of understanding mediating processes is by focusing on observable interactions between participants in the design solutions. Ideally, observable interactions can directly show how embodied elements of a design mediate participants' interaction and thus learning. The second way to understand mediating processes is to analyze artifacts that participants produce from their activity. Such artifacts are proxies for learning processes. They indicate the extent to which learners are engaged in the sort of activity and thinking hypothesized to actually matter. And finally, mediating processes are intended to produce desired outcomes. Now, different design research projects will pursue different outcomes, such as cognitive outcomes, affective outcomes, psychomotor outcomes, interpersonal outcomes, and they will use a wide range of approaches to gather evidence of those outcomes. Now, there's one more thing we have to do. So far, our conjecture map explains the what and the why of our solution, but it doesn't necessarily set us up for research. For that reason, we need two more pieces design conjectures, and theoretical conjectures. First, we have design conjectures, which take the form of, if learners engage in this activity structure with these tools through this discursive practice, then this mediating process will emerge. Design conjectures should be tested. In other words, do the expected mediating processes actually occur in the real world? Can these processes be traced back to the design elements, the tools, the materials, and the tasks? 
As a design-based researcher, you will want to specify the methods you will use to test these design conjectures. Furthermore, we also have theoretical conjectures which take the form of, if this mediating process occurs, it will lead to this outcome. As with design conjectures, we will want to test for these theoretical conjectures in order to trace them back from outcome to process. And again, this will require appropriate measurement of outcomes using valid and reliable instrumentation. So that is conjecture mapping. Stepping back, these elements, embodiments, mediating processes, and outcomes provide the structure for mapping specific testable conjectures and the relations among them. Using conjecture mapping helps design researchers focus simultaneously on understanding the design intervention and its theoretical understanding. And I believe it's going to help all of you flesh out the rest of your design arguments. So our focus this week will be on design and specifically drilling down and specifying our conjecture map. Okay, everyone, we're out of time for today. Have a great week and I'll see you in Canvas.